Okay. Hand over to you, Abby. Lovely. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Let's get back to the beginning. There we are. Can you just let me know, Kate, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes, that's fine. And can I just remind people to, to mute their microphones unless they're actually talking, please, so we don't get any feedback from the mics. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you. Right then. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's me, Abby Steele, here to talk to you about Rocket Phonics for Year 2 or P3. So today's plan, it's going to be quite a full session. I have a lot to tell you about. Um, we are going to look at what resources there are for year two, what the ethos is, and that's really important, same as it is with Rocket Phonics. There's a lot of conceptual things to think about behind, you know, why it is the way it is. We're going to look at what the structure is, so what it looks like as a, a map across the year and what it looks like by the week and what it looks like by the lesson. We're going to think about how it works with the reading books, have a think about how we support students that might have additional needs or be um, low attainers. Uh, and if we get time, just remind you of what training and ongoing support there is for you with this. So what resources do we have for year two? We have three more big books, our teaching texts that we use. So big book seven, Acornwood Academy. It has the feel of Hogwarts, but we're really, really careful at Rising Stars with cultural insensitivities. So you'll notice that um, we play it very safe. We don't have things like magic in books if we can avoid it because of religions and cultures that don't like that kind of thing. So although we have this, this feel of Hogwarts and kind of a Harry Potter-esque feel, there's nothing actually magical in it. This one's about a group of children who have some adventures and solve a mystery. The narrative is in the past tense and third person. And this type of feature is something where we're trying to add variety, but we're also trying to build in really subtle age appropriate things. So you might never actually talk to children about the fact of what tense the story's in, but it's there to give them experiences of that, which will be backing up what you do in your English lessons. There are more spelling examples per spread. So where in the earlier year groups, you might look at a spread like this one is the sound A, and you might have one way of spelling A. In this example, we've got four different ways of spelling A because we're sort of up leveling and thinking much more about spelling alternatives. Um, in these big books as well, we have non-fiction features woven in. So on some of the pages, you'll notice things like a newspaper extract or an instruction text or somebody's written a list or somebody's written a diary. And those again are features there for you to explore as appropriate with your group of children. Big book eight, Hannah's Big Trip, is all about a young girl called Hannah who lives in London with her mum, but actually her heritage, her family, they're from New Zealand. So she goes on this journey, it's a journey story, goes to New Zealand with her mum to meet her with her grandparents and learn all about that heritage. This book is in the present tense. And it's a third person narrative again. So present tense is just a different style for children to be exposed to. And one of the features of this big book is it's got a story within a story. So there's a part where granddad is telling Hannah about some of the traditions and he tells her a story within this story. So that's a nice feature for children to be exposed to too. And then big book nine, Lucas and the Sea Turtles. Lucas and his parents live in Costa Rica. So again, another geographical aspect to bring in, and they work on sea turtle conservation projects, so an, an ecological sort of aspect there as well, and they solve some problems. This book is in past tense, first person narrative, so again, another little spin for children there. Um, the big books are structured in very similar way to Reception and Year One, in that one big book is your teaching stimulus, for a full term. And each big book is broken up into two episodes. Each episode takes you through a six week teaching block. So that's a similar structure. We have flashcards. So one of the kind of things that you'll see in the ethos of Rocket Phonics for year two is that we are looking at year two basic literacy, but we're coming at it from a phonics perspective, particularly for spelling. Spelling is such a huge issue. So we are maintaining some of this alphabetic code work, looking at the alphabetic code. And although the vast majority of this is revision for children, what you tend to find is that particularly able learners, when they hit year two and they start doing less with phonics, 
they can lose some of those skills and they hit a bit of a ceiling. So we want to maintain that phonics practice, the letter sounds for a little bit longer. So we've got 111 flashcards, same idea of the grapheme on the front and the word examples for blending or for giving a spelling example or for showing different pronunciations on the back. They are not in hard copy, they're download and print or use on the screen. They're color coded to fit in with the progression of year two. And they're organized into six half termly decks. Visual support, there'll be an alphabetic code chart and some word family posters, six word family posters, one for each half term that give you an example of you know, what it is that you're focusing on in that half term. So you can build those up cumulative, cumulatively or you can display them all at once. Um, and at the moment, these have been with the design team and they've been trying to work with me sort of taking my plain examples here and trying to zhuzh them up and make them more appealing. And the designs that we've got at the moment aren't working for me at all. I think they've lost the focus of sort of the usability. So we're going back to the drawing board to find, try and find a compromise in making them look aesthetically appealing, um, but they've got to convey the information a bit more clearly. Then our pupil practice booklets, there are six pupil practice booklets and this time we've got one double page spread per lesson. In reception in year one we were using one page per lesson, um, but this time we're sort of doubling up with a bit more quantity and we'll talk about the sort of progression in those in a little while. You also still need a lined exercise notebook for any extension tasks and there's a little composition activity that children will need to do in a notebook. Then we've got leveled reading books. So leveled reading books, we're looking at continuing that journey for children with their reading, taking them through turquoise, purple, gold, and white levels, age appropriate levels, and bridging across to get them into key stage two. And there are 72 of these aligned to this part of the programme, which gives you two per week as the recommendation. Here are the two books that we suggest that you look at. They are, they come from the galaxy fiction and non-fiction series and also the Comet Street Kids series. So there's a mixture of fiction, non-fiction, poetry and Comet Street to give variety. Um, some of them are books that have existed for a while. They're existing books you might already have them in your school. And some of these books are completely brand new books that have recently sort of been published. Alongside all of those leveled reading books, they all have, same as we do in reception year one, teaching notes for a lesson plan and an activity that you can use. And in the inside front cover of those books is flagged up some vocabulary that you might want to identify and highlight with children before you read or know about that they might come across in those books. Of course, all those books are e-books as well as hard copy books, same as we do earlier on. And then teacher guide three, same deal as before, broken up into useful sections, an introductory section explaining all of the ethos and the pedagogy and some useful documents, weekly plans, daily lesson plans, assessment and SEND guidance. So that was a little whistle stop tour of what the resources are. Very, very similar and consistent with the earlier parts of the program. Now the ethos, this is where it starts to get more exciting, looking at, well, what's the concept behind this? How is it going to work? And something for you to sort of, there's something that really excites me about this is that when publishers and educational authors usually develop educational materials, we start from the national curriculum. So we'll take the national curriculum or whatever document that we're working for, and we create something to fulfill that. So we are guided very heavily by what's in that national curriculum. And one of the reasons that I have always worked more with Rising Stars rather than other publishers, I have worked with other publishers, but I dig down with Rising Stars, is because they have always been really, really willing to listen to Yep, yeah, this is what the national curriculum says, but actually this is what teachers want and this is what teachers need. And yes, we have to cover the national curriculum, but how we might present that might look slightly different to really be useful and effective. So this has been designed primarily, the first port of call is, well, what do year two children need for literacy? Yes, we cover everything in national curriculum and I'll show you that later, but the starting point is the children. So we are revisiting the alphabetic code. It is absolutely bonkers to think that by the age of six or seven, our young learners will have embedded 130 pieces of alphabetic code. 
Now, most children will have done a, a remarkable job. They're incredible at, yes, learning that alphabetic code and they're very good with their reading and they're okay with their spelling. But spelling is something, knowing the spelling alternative is something that takes years and years to crack. And historically, you might do phonics in reception in year one, and then at year two, you might switch to a spelling program. And the spelling program might vary in you know, um, consistency or quality or scope or what it does, but there's a bit of a disconnect between the spelling program usually and the phonics program. And what we're doing is we're, we're bridging that and we're extending in. We're taking the phonics up and we're focusing more for spelling, but we're going back through the code. The code is the code. There's a very, very small amount of extra code. A little example here is the all sound. In year one, we looked at the LE spelling and there was an opportunity for discussion about other spellings in the lesson, but actually it was focusing on LE and we didn't touch upon IL, AL and EL. Now for reading, those graphemes are no bother at all. You can sound it as apple, al, and you can tweak it to all, not a problem. For spelling, this is a hard spelling point. So now we are introducing these bits of code and concentrating on them. We have got a really gentle progression. So when we look at the progression in a, in a bit about what it looks like in year one and then what it looks like in year two, it's a really smooth, natural progression for them. And we're embedding, we're embedding the literacy skills that we've put into place in reception in year one. We've got this idea of layered learning with fluidity. So we've got this structure, but we're constantly thinking about things that we've already done and revisiting and embedding, things that we might not have done yet, sort of new bits coming on, and moving backwards and forwards throughout that. And we'll look at what that looks like in a typical week in a minute. We're focusing on basic literacy skills. So leveled reading, spelling alternatives, and we include things like homophones, suffixes, contractions, possessive apostrophes, and of course, vocabulary all the time. We teach learners to take ownership of cursive handwriting with explicit teaching. So in Rocket Phonics, um, it's there as a sort of slightly compartmentalized section so that if we have schools in the market that absolutely do not want to take our handwriting approach, then they'll be able to not take the handwriting approach, they can just not do that bit. But obviously we really strongly encourage that people consider it because we have quite a unique way of really explicitly directly teaching cursive straight into cursive, but actually getting learners to really um, think about that and take ownership of it themselves. And then in line with our ethos coming up through, whole class teaching is our preference, it's what we promote, but with this really clever thing of dual aspect teaching for those with additional needs. So you'll see it in the structure, but we carry on forwards with year two teaching, but we can have our lower attainers come along with us and still get what they need as well. So whole class, but it's dual aspect, we're sort of coping with lots of differentiation. A little example then of what this layered learning looks like. So we would approach the week and we might say at the beginning of the week, this week we are going to be learning about the different ways the sound O is spelled. So this week is an O week. All week we're thinking about O and we're going to look through the days at the different way we spell it. As part of your introduction, your teach part at the beginning, you'll be using your big book to introduce and to talk about the spellings, but you'll be wanting to put up, you can do it digitally, I would do it on flip chart paper, a chart which has blank sections of here are the different spelling banks, the different ways that we're going to spell, and we're going to gather this information through the week. So I'm going to start off with a blank chart at the beginning of the week like this, and we'll look at what it looks like at the end of the week. So on Monday, we're learning about O spelled O-A, and this is revision, we have had this introduced before, but now we can access it with a higher level vocabulary, we can think about it more closely for spelling, and you can see here in the grapheme search, we've got O examples that we've pulled out, including some which are the sound O, but they're not the spelling that is the focus spelling. And this is this kind of layering. We're focusing on OA, but there are other spellings that we might notice or we might touch upon. And in this example, we've got the word chose and we've got the word don't. And chose is a discussion point. So we can have a discussion with the children about how we approach the word chose. Do we approach it with a split digraph O or do we approach it that that letter O has got its long vowel sound and that the S and the E are working together as the Z sound. We've then got this section with word banks where the children are going to write O words into the correct columns. Now, some of those words they can pull from the lessons. They've just looked at loads of different words with the OA spelling. So they can choose some of those and put them in that little box. But then you've got this column with the split digraph OE. 
And we haven't been covering that in this lesson, but it's not new learning. So we're asking, what can you recall from memory? What, you know, what words do you know that have got this spelling to start putting them in there? And it might be that on this day, they think of one or two words. Some may think of more, some may think of less, but we're just popping those in there and we're going to visit that tomorrow and then think about it again. So those are words from the lesson and it can be words from memory. On Tuesday, we're going to still be thinking about O, but now we are thinking about that split digraph O. So we've got our words that we're going to pull from our text and we've got the same chart. And this time we can say, when you fill in your column for the OA spelling, what words can you recall? What can you remember from yesterday's lesson? Now today you can put more words into this split digraph column and it'll be interesting to see the progression of how many you've got now that we've been thinking about it compared to yesterday when you were just trying to recall them. And have you discovered any other examples at home or when you were reading or in other lessons and it becomes an investigation and children start to come to the lesson and say, oh, I've discovered this one at home, I want to add it into my little chart. That's fine, add it to your little chart. Then Wednesday, we're looking at our next spelling of O, we're looking at the OW, and this time on the chart, we're seeing, can we remember a few from earlier in the week? What have we got from today? Have we found any more in our investigations through the week? So again, just this idea of recalling, remembering, building up word banks, thinking about these different spellings. And then Thursday, because we're Monday through Thursday with this, on Thursday, we're looking at our final two versions of the O spelling. And here in the text, we've got another word, we've got gemstone, which refers back to our split digrapho. They might want to turn back to a previous page and pop that on their chart. They might want to add that word to the chart that you're building up as a whole class, because that's a new word that they've not come across yet. And you've got some additional discussion points. So here, you might be talking about how, um, how you produce with your accent or whether you need to tweak the O in old and gold, because those are quite odd ones and sometimes sound a bit different in different people's accents. I've got the O in boulder and shoulder, and that's a much rarer example. So we're not actually going to build a word bank for that one. We're just going to notice them. And you might, because they're year two, talk about things like plurals here with potato and pota potato, potatoes, tomato, tomatoes, um, and look at how that spelling affects it. So we're layering because we were visiting things all the way through the week. And by the end of the week, by the end of, sort of Thursday, you'd be looking at having grouped and gathered this huge bank of words with all of these different spellings on your flip chart paper, which ideally for me, I would have on flip chart paper and I would then put on my working wall that can be displayed there for a couple of weeks so that we can carry that learning forwards and think about that. What you want is learners who, if a visitor came to the classroom, and said, oh, tell me about what you're doing here, that they would be really engaged in, oh, all this week we've been thinking about the sound O and we've been really thinking about the different ways of spelling. And look, that's our chart upon the wall where we've been gathering loads of interesting words together. And it's that engagement that they have with this sort of learning environment and what they've been doing that really sort of helps them to sort of embed it um, and explain it to other people. So a little bit on progression and what progression looks like. Here we've got three pages from three different pupil practice booklets. We've got the first one is from um, in reception, so very, very early on. The next one is from in year one. And then the last one is from in year two. It's all the sound or. We, we learn about or in reception. We learn about more ways of spelling or in year one. And in year two, we revisit or and we're really thinking about which, which words are spelled which way. You can see a difference in the font. We've got our sort of Sassoon primary infant font that we use in reception. That's what they see in their reading books, that style. Then in year one, we use a stone font because that's the font that is used in reading books at year one. And now when we come to year two, because we're focusing on cursive writing and it's such a big feature, we've shown the grapheme with the join there as well so they can have exposure to that. A particular thing to notice, I mean, some things are really obvious like the quantity of text and um, the sort of more pictures earlier on. But a particular feature to notice is in the grapheme search what it is the learners are being asked to do. So when they're in reception, they're asked to find and circle all the OR letters, the OR letters, because when little children do a grapheme search and they're tiny, they're not thinking at all about what sound it represents. They're thinking about the letters that they can see. So it's very limited. It's very safe. They just look for the letters that they're being told to look for. When they get into year one, they're told a bit more explicitly 
you need to find and circle all the or sounds when it's represented by the A, W graphemes. So if in that, and there isn't an example in this one, but if in this one, the word fork had been in there, if they spotted fork, you'd, you'd give them loads of praise. Oh, that's fantastic. You found another way of spelling the or sound in fork. That's great. But the ones I want you to spot and really find are the ones with the A, W. And sometimes in these pieces of text, there might be a word with A, W, but it's not representing an or sound. The one that springs to the mind that I always use in training is where it's a split digraph I and they've got Mike and bike and spike and pike. And then there's the word river and they all circle the word river because it looks like it's got a split digraph, the I and the E, but it actually hasn't. It's not that sound. So in year one, they're sort of drilling down a bit more and thinking a bit more carefully about is it the sound? Is it the letters? Now at year two, different ball game again underline all the graphemes that are code for the or sound. So the intention is that there, there'll be lots of examples of the focus spelling, which in this case is the AW, but there will be other words that contain the or sound spelled with different spelling patterns for them to notice. And as you can imagine with open-ended differentiation, some learners will be really great at spotting those and others will be less confident at spotting those. But when you go through it with them, it'll be a really good talking point. Oh, let's have a look at the word also, also. Do you say it as also, also? And fall, fall has got an or in as, as well, but how is that spelled? And look at those spellings of morning, morning's got an or in, but it's spelled with the other example, but we want them to find that and that's the instruction for them. So that's quite a nice example of progression, both visually seeing how it progresses, but also seeing in the instruction, what our expectation of them is, is a real progression there. And also quite nice to see here, actually there's a lot in this that is still that same formula. We're still doing revisit and review, we're still doing a grapheme search, we're still doing comprehension question. There's a lot here that continues that routine. So the teaching of handwriting, what does that look like? So handwriting is put for a Friday, which, which makes it this kind of um, slightly separate component that if people really aren't going to do that handwriting they don't have to do it so it's on a Friday slightly separately but I obviously really encourage people to do it and that you practice it on a Friday but children from very very quickly in year two are encouraged to use cursive all the time for their writing we're going for it we're year two we teach it explicitly and we use it and we really think about it so this involves the explicit teaching of the joins and the formation, especially the hook over. And we use this quite distinctive diagonal line for the lead in and then a smile or a washing line join. There's just two joins that we have to learn, but we have to learn when we do letters, particularly these letters, this family of letters, we must do that hook over the top. We must really think about that. Super simple approach, just those two joins that we can practice in little boxes to get the hang of those. Everything starts on the line, dead simple, all starts on the line, unless obviously it's a capital letter. You may well want to do, and I would encourage you to do an introductory lesson or a little session at the beginning of the year saying, right, we're year two now, we're gonna go for this with this cursive. These are the joins we need to do. We need to really think about being slow and careful just so they've had a little bit of an intro to it. So they're not just hitting the ground with it because we're directly teaching it, we're not doing an approach of they look and they copy. If they look and they copy, they're not going to embed what it is that they need to do. We really want pupil engagement with, well, what have I actually got to do? You know, where do I put my pen? How do I go around over the top? How do I join that letter up? How they do it and why? Why they need to join certain letters in certain ways. There are no um, double lines or dotty lines or gray lines or red lines. The vast majority of pupils, when taught directly and when told from the very beginning, you've got to take responsibility for looking at the size and the space that you've got and for thinking about where you start your letter, how, how far around you go, how high up you go, how low down you go. It's, it can be actually a quicker route for them to not have those scaffolds of all of those additional lines to be thinking about they very quickly do take responsibility for thinking about the sizing and the spacing. This very stiff diagonal join really helps them with spacing the letters out as well and not getting everything cramped up. And then they can see their joins and they can see how they're joining the letters. 
emphasis on slow and accurate. So in this lesson, we're practicing, we're going to be very slow if we need to be, because we're really gonna try and get all of our joins accurate and think about how the letters join together. Gradually, those stiff diagonals will naturally soften up and you'll end up with more classical looking um, cursive writing. So the handwriting is grouped into families, it's on two pages of the people practice booklet, meaning that you can split how you do it if you want, or you can go all across. There's a little space at the top for them to do sort of practicing on. And as you can see, it goes from letter level to word level and down to sentence level. And then we encourage them to use that immediately in their writing. The structure of year two. So a little bit looking at the national curriculum then, because I feel as if one of the questions that year two teachers will have is, how does rocket phonics for year two fit in with our English that we already do or our literacy? Like, what are we doing in rocket phonics? How far are we going and what are we not doing? Well, when we look at the national curriculum and the statutory requirements, in terms of word reading, rocket phonics covers it 100%. We do that bit. We do all the word reading requirements. In terms of spelling, 100% we do all the spelling requirements. Everything from the national curriculum in the English appendix, statutory requirements is in rocket phonics structure. That's done and dusted. Handwriting, we cover that and then some actually. So we're absolutely there for the handwriting. 100% we cover that. Comprehension, when you look in the national curriculum at comprehension, there's kind of a first part and a second part. Now this first part, we're kind of halfway with that. We do do a lot of this, but for me as a teacher teaching year two, there are things that are not in rocket phonics that you do need to supplement. You do need to do in your provision for your ch children in their English or in, in, for example, their class reading book that you read to them. Things like wide range of contemporary and classic poetry stories and nonfiction at a level beyond that at which they can read independently. Now we are doing an abundance of texts, poetry and fiction and nonfiction, of course we are within the concept of it being level texts, but I still feel like, and I hate the term real books because scheme books are real books, but it's those real books, isn't it? It's the real modern, um, the latest picture book or really classic poetry that you still need to build that in. Becoming increasingly familiar with and retelling a wider range of stories. We have a pretty wide range. I want it wider. And that's, you know, just good practice. Non-fiction books that are structured in different ways. We have non-fiction, but it's not going to be as wide as the range that you're going to get if you use library books or real books and poetry. So we have poetry built in, but from my point of view, it's not enough poetry. You still need to do more poetry in your English provision. The second part of comprehension, we 100% cover it. We absolutely smash it. We do all of the kind of skills of comprehension. That's all covered in what we do in Rocket Phonics. Composition, so writing, we go some way, it's not explicit. So there's lots of opportunities for children to look at um, pieces of text, for them to do little compositional pieces, but we're not focusing on the teaching of compositional pieces. So in each lesson, there's a little bit at the end that says, um, oh, you know, carry on this story or write what you think the conversation would be or write a letter to this character. So there's loads of little opportunities, but it's very open-ended and it's not managed by the teacher. It's just a chance for children to apply their phonics and apply their foundational literacy skills. So you would still be doing in your English provision, compositional writing, either through a scheme or whether you do that yourselves, but this kind of writing aspect, that's for your English. And then vocabulary, grammar and punctuation. We do loads and loads of vocabulary. The grammar aspect, there's loads of opportunities and we do things like having the different tenses in those narratives. So we cover a lot of this, but not explicitly. So we don't have lesson plans where we talk about, oh, now we're going to look at expanded noun phrases. You could build that into some of this work or you'll have that in your English work. So we do loads of it, but there are still bits that you need to do in your English, but it's certainly perhaps a lot fuller than people might imagine. This is not just a little bit of phonics and spelling. There's a tiny bit of English. It covers a lot more of the national curriculum and therefore you can be more flexible with your timetable allowances and how long a lesson might be. Okay, progression map. So this is what a progression map looks like at reception and at year one the sounds that we cover, the tricky words that we cover, and how we map along with the colour banding of the books. 
When we go to year two, so have a close look here at the year one. You can see, for example, we've got I, O, E, and then U, and then U, and you can see the colors. Year two, very, very similar. Uh, where do you find the progression map? It's brand new. I just made it for this presentation, um, but it is something that we need to get out there. And I don't know the quickest and easiest way. Oh, I'll tell you what, for you guys, the quickest and easiest way is if I send a copy of it to Kate and then Kate can send it out to you. It's just on a Word document. So if you need to adapt this at all for your website, for example, to put your information, you absolutely can. But this is the clever bit. This is year two. So year two revisits the code, not in identical order to year one, but it pretty much goes back over in the order of year one, but we're just going a bit further with it. So where we maybe looked at the A sound, we might have looked at five or six spelling alternatives. Now we're looking at eight. So we're going a bit further, but because we go back through in pretty much the same order, it means we can dual aspect it with the reading books. So children that are on track will be revisiting all of this phonics for their spelling primarily. And then for their reading, we'll be guiding them through turquoise, then purple, then gold, then white, keeping them sort of age appropriate on track. Children that are our low attainers, um, perhaps it might be EAL children, it might be some of our SEND children, because of course we need to consider everybody in sort of each group in their own sort of right. But actually, because of the content that we're covering in the phonics, this maps against the blue, the green and the orange books. So if they were in the lesson, the main class teaching for the phonics content, for example, the A sounds, but they're not a confident turquoise reader, they can be reading the blue books that tie in with the A sound, like a target practice reader, and you can kind of run them alongside each other really, really smoothly. We don't have along their um, common exception words uh, or tricky words because at year two, we don't need them in Rocket Phonics because everything's covered through phonics. There are a teeny, teeny, tiny amount of words. I think it's like beautiful and the number two written as a word. And those are popped into the planning, but there aren't enough for us to have a thread of common exception words. We just don't need them. This is what it looks like on a scope and sequence document. This is the same document that we used earlier in the program. This maps out for you week by week. If, if you follow the program week by week, if you really stick to it, this is exactly what you would be covering each week in terms of the phonics, the spelling. And then you can see how it maps out each six week half term block. We have four weeks with a phonics and spelling focus. And then we have two weeks at the end, which are things like homophones, near homophones, suffixes, possessive apostrophes and suffixes, contractions and suffixes, and that's repeated throughout. So that's the kind of structure. And you can see that the cursive handwriting focus, that's also on a six week cycle to take you through all of the letters and all of the letter joins. This is the same information, but just blocked into half term blocks. This is the same as we show it lower down in the program. We just block it into these half term blocks. That means that if you weren't, for example, sticking to it week by week, if you had additional, you know, other needs of ways of doing it in your school, you can still have that expectation of the expectation is that this is what you cover in this half term to enable you to move through all the content in time through the year. So going back to the systematic synthetic phonics teaching principles, what does it look like at year two? For their knowledge of the alphabetic code, for most children, they've got a pretty good basic knowledge, but it's that confidence in the code. Confidence in the code, being really fluent in when they see the grapheme, which sound do they need to project, pronounce? Um, when they hear a sound, which way is it spelled? For blending, we're moving along with age appropriate vocabulary. When you visit the code the first time round in reception in year one, you're working cumulatively. So, you might be looking at, for example, split digraph E in year one, but at the point that you learn about split digraph E in year one, you can't have the word seen, S-C-E-N-E, -E, because you haven't learned the bit of code that is S-C as the S sound. Now, many people would just naturally talk about that, and that's absolutely fine. But if we're being really pedantic, as sometimes 
phonics people are these days, um, you shouldn't have that word in your teaching. And it wouldn't be in our lozenges, for example, in the big book, the word C. When you come back to it in year two, now everything's open, everything's fair game. So now when we revisit the split digraph E, we can have the word C because we have already done that piece of code earlier on. For the skill of segmenting, we're absolutely focusing on which way do we spell this word. That is such a huge focus for it. And for handwriting, we're focusing on cursive. When we think about the definition of phonics, this is something I often talk about with reception in year one of, well, what is it we're trying to do in phonics? We're trying to pack in all of these different things, actually. We're trying to do code level, word level, vocabulary, sentence level, fluency, text level, comprehension. This is exactly the same idea in year two, but it's at a year two age appropriate way. So we're still thinking about the teaching and learning cycle as being our structure for a lesson. But in reception in year one, where we had so much to pack in, there was so much learning going on, and we wanted to slow it down to two, two letter sounds a week to introduce and teach it, we split those skills, blending and segmenting, and that enabled us to fit it all in. Now we're in year two, we can put it all back together. So it's a combined lesson. It is blending and segmenting skills. It is basic literacy skills in one lesson. For revisit and review, you use flashcards to revisit and review previous knowledge. For teaching, you use your big book teaching story as your stimulus with your flip chart for modeling, modeling and gathering word examples. And then practice and application in your people practice booklet, remembering to spend some time to review that and go through it all together. And then further application using a leveled reading book and how that looks might be different in different schools. So some people will have those out on the desks, the children finish their people practice booklet and then they get their um, leveled book and they read their level book independently or they might read it in pairs um, some some schools might do at the end of that lesson all together guided by an adult a short reading session that might be daily or it might be weekly some schools will do group guided reading with that some schools will do whole class shared reading with that it's whatever works for your school very flexible same approach that is earlier down so an, another example of a weekly structure this time looking at the sound a here we have the sound A, Monday through to Thursday, and each day we're looking at two different ways of spelling it. And on Friday, we have that cursive handwriting focus practice. An example of the weekly plans, exactly the same format as earlier down in the programme. And in the weekly plans is where you'll get extra bits of information, things like support with common exception word centre, or support with common exception words beautiful and two. So that's just flagging to you. Actually, here are a few words that the children might need a little bit of support with, unlikely by this point, but they might. And this will also point out spelling things like you've got there, AI is virtually never used at the end of English words, AY is used at the end of words and syllables, um, things that children might notice, they might also notice the EY spelling as in they in that lesson. A rarer example of an A spelling is AE as in ice cream sundae. An ice cream sundae, that AE spelling, we don't have a lesson focus on that because it's rare. There's hardly any words with that spelling. So we're just gonna have it as an aside. An example of a daily plan. So the daily plans haven't yet been put into the formatting. They're with design at the moment. They will look like the plan that's on the right-hand side, which comes from earlier in the program. The plan that's just written out in a Word document, this is what they look like before they're designed up, and it's all exactly the same sections. And it just gives you your guidance there. So for example, revisit and review, use a selection of deck one, flashcards one to 21 to revise letter sound correspondences, tip, use the words on the reverse of the cards to revisit and review word decoding, tip, if the grapheme can represent more than one sound, ask for recall of more sounds. So if you're holding up the letter A grapheme, say, this can be, a, or it can be A, we want that sort of flexibility. For teaching, show children flashcards one and two, the sort of focus for lesson, and say there are several ways to spell the sound A. Today we're focusing on two of those spellings, A-I and A-Y. The A-I spelling is virtually never used at the end of English words. The A-Y spelling is used at the end of words and syllables. And we can have a look at some words in our lesson and see if that's true. We'll see if we can find an exception. We'll test that out bit of guidance for you to look at your big book and then people practice application. How do the reading books work? So when we're thinking about reception in year one, the provision you might be thinking for for them is that they would have target practice readers that really focus in on smaller steps of the code. 
You might also then have the sort of wider rocket phonics that cover bigger batches of code and other decodables from other schemes. You might have some old style book branded books that you're desperately hanging on to and can't bear to throw out, even though you're not really sure what they use for anymore, and library books. When you're thinking about year two, you might still be thinking about target practice readers or lower leveled readers for the not, not quite there yet learners. So it's possible you might have children come to year two and they're not quite on track. Um, they might still need a bit of that earlier stuff. The vast majority will now be working through leveled, age appropriate readers, turquoise, purple, gold and white, and library books. What this might look like in provision, this is an example for year one. So for example, in year one, this little girl called Bobby in class uses her target practice reader. The teacher has been teaching about the sound I. Across two weeks, they've been learning about four different ways of spelling I, and then in class, they use a book like Spike the Spy because it matches the teaching and it's for practice and application. In her book bag for going home, she might have a Rocket Phonics book or another decodable book, and it could be physical or she might get allocated an ebook or both. And that book matches the child's ability for independent application. So although she's working on that blue book, Spike the Spy in class, when she goes home, it's whatever her level is. So in this example, she's got um, Helen Sharman, which is a yellow level book. It's the level behind because they've already taught all of the yellow levels. She can read the yellow level. But you might have a child who reads a much higher level book or a much lower level book. And that book in the book bag is matched to the child, irrelevant of it being higher or lower. The book that we use in class really helps us to make sure that we're covering everything for age appropriate. We might be, although we're reading it, we might be getting all sorts of different things from that. And we might be using it in a way as a vehicle to think about our spellings as well. It's part of the teaching. In the book bag, then a second book, which might be a free choice library book, and that's child's choice. And that book is for sharing, reading together, listening to another person read. And then in class, it's optional, but there might be other decodables, the older book banded books, library books, and they might be used for some guided reading still or in book areas. Uh, little thing that was put on Facebook, I don't know if any of you saw it in the group, which is brilliant from um, Dominique Kelly at Redfield Edge near Bristol. They've been putting their target practice readers in these gold unlocked boxes on the children's tables. When they've taught this patch, they've taught this sort of batch of sounds, then they put them in the table and say, well, you've now unlocked these books. These are the books that we're going to read now that tie in. So that was just a nice idea I wanted to slip in and mention. At year two, in class, a leveled reader, for example, a turquoise reader, we're in term one, we're on turquoise reader, it's age appropriate, it matches the class teaching level for practice and application. It doesn't necessarily match the phonics. When because of the code, we revisit the code the first time round. it finishes at orange level. When we're working at books that are beyond orange level, they can contain any code because it's not new. It's all been visited before. They're age appropriate in terms of vocabulary, um, quantity of text, concepts in the text, grammar features, that kind of thing. In the book bag, the book bag that goes home might be a leveled reader. And it might be a turquoise reader because Bobby might be completely on track. She's turquoise in class. She's turquoise for going home. Lovely. Bobby might be a low attainer. She might be accessing turquoise in class because it's supported in a guided reading or a whole class read. She's got that support from her peers and from her teacher. So her book that goes home in the book bag might be a lower level reader, like a target practice reader, because if she's working behind, we're really gonna focus in on exactly what level she needs and how she might be practicing the phonics. It is entirely likely that she's just been doing I again in year two in class, so Spike the Spy is absolutely appropriate for her to be reading, but there's such a wide amount of books, there's tons to choose from. Equally, Bobby might be a really high level reader, she might already be on white books. If that's what's right for her, that's what's right for her, that's absolutely fine. But in class, we're gonna work on turquoise because we're still gonna get lots from that. Again, a second book for home, like a free choice library book, which is child's choice for sharing, reading together, listening to another person read. And in class, there might be other, other leveled reader books, library or choosing books in the book area, and that's fine. 
This is just a little example in, um, this is actually a reception weekly plan, which is just showing you in the weekly plans at reception, it flags up and says to you, this is the point you've unlocked these books. This is the first time you've taught the alphabetic code. The children can now read the cog and it is not a dot. At year two, what this would look like is on a sort of plan, Here's week one, you've just been teaching this bit of code in week one. Our recommendation is that you use this week for your class reading and teaching The Tower of Doom, which is a galaxy fiction book, and or Snip Snip, which is a Comet Street Kids book, which sort of matches that level. And it gives you a path, it gives you a way to work through and get that coverage and that spread and then the progression as well. How does Rocket Phonics support additional needs? So very, very similar ethos and concept to um, reception and year one, uh, but with this little bit more transparency about this dual aspect teaching. So the concept, we're already revisiting and embedding the alphabetic code. So by simply doing that, we're actually supporting all learners, because I really think that all learners shouldn't be racing on and leaving this code behind. They need more of it to embed it. So we're already doing a great help there. The ethos of layering and constantly thinking about what have we done, what do we know, can we go back, and it being basically literacy skills, that's really helpful. The structure with it being really manageable half-termly batches of content and teachers understanding the progression pathway, sort of how that looks and how this concept of we're revisiting the same code, we've up-leveled it, the pitch is higher, but it's the same code, that really helps sort of understanding how that works. The fact that we've got this wider definition of phonics, that we're actually supporting learners with vocabulary, speaking and listening, all those basic skills. Adaptation, it goes without saying, in Rocket Phonics, resources can be enlarged. They can be used on individual devices. There's audio and headphones. The books have already got things like dyslexia-friendly pastel paper. You can download and print individual sets. So if you need flashcards for individual children that go in their book bag or that sit on their desk for a bit of extra practice, all of that can be made to the right shape and size and individual copies for your learners. Still this idea of open-ended differentiation. So when pupils are working in their pupil practice booklet, they might all have the same content in the same booklet, but the way in which they're accessing that content might be different. Your expectations might be different, the outcomes might be different, and the support that you give them might be different. Intervention, the first port of call for intervention is using their pupil practice booklet, that they revisit that content, but they're given more time and more support, or one or the other, more time, more support, either. and we're going to look at something a bit clever with that in a minute. Um, uh, which is this, this kind of bit here of the, our guidance is, is that you always think about inclusion, so social inclusion, raised expectation, keeping children who are lower attainers or who might be SEND or who might have EAL needs, keep them within the main whole class teaching, but when they break off to do their practice and application, it might be that they have the same people practice booklet, but the support is different or the access is different or the outcomes are different. It might be that they have practice and application at a lower level, but it's not going to be different from the whole class teaching input. And I think it will come up in a minute. There's a slide that shows it. Um, helping us, of course, identify needs and how we're getting through assessments and checkpoints. There are informal half term checkpoints at the end of each people practice booklet. There are two little assessments. And my suggestion is that you don't use these as heavy formal assessments. You can use these with children as a lesson, self-assessment. Right, guys, we've come to the end of our booklet. We're going to have a look at assessment A. We're going to self-assess. How confident do we feel? We're going to go through and look at, do we know these sounds? We're going to say them and we're going to tick them. And if we're not sure, we might put a dot or a circle around them. Don't worry, because we'll help you with that. Let's have a look at if we can read the words. So I want you to, to read the words and we'll say them and tick them. And you know you might have some children who go tick, 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 and they haven't actually read the words, but you'll know who you're looking out for. And then you can do a bit of, I'm going to come round and I'm going to listen to some of you read your words. A word level dictation, right? I'm going to read you some words. I want you to listen and write the words. You're looking for their spelling and looking at their handwriting. A sentence for them to read. And there's a little comprehension question for that and for writing a sentence as well. So a little snapshot at the end of each half term of all of those skills from code level to word level to sentence level for reading and for writing. 
And then also some slightly more formal end of half term checkpoints, um, which certainly, uh, I don't know how it will work with Kate and with trials, but from my point of view are absolutely optional, but they'll be there for you for every half term. There'll be a spelling task and a reading task. The spelling task will be linked directly to the content just taught in the previous six weeks. A total of 12 spellings, two examples from each week in the half term block and it's SAT style. So we're gently introducing them to the style and format of SAT papers. But when you do practice SAT papers, you're covering all the content from the whole of year two could crop up in that SAT paper. This is like a really gentle introduction of that style of questioning, but it only co it contains content from what they've just been practicing. So actually here with these spellings, you can see that the first two, one and two, cake and straight, are words that are A words, which is what we did in the first week. And in the second week, we were thinking about E words, and we've got donkey and completed. In the third week, we're on I, and we've got side and time. The fourth week was O, window and cold. The fifth week was homophones and near homophones, so we've got blue and quiet. And the sixth week was all about uh, suffixes, so we've got painter, and at the one at the bottom is benches. So it's just really linked closely to what you've just done. The reading example, I don't have an example. I've just cut and pasted a SATS example to stick there and show you. But it would be a very short leveled piece of reading text at sort of turquoise level with four, maybe six comprehension style questions, sort of SATS style questions, just to give them a really simple snapshot of this is what SATS style is like, but it's related to the content and the level on, not kind of the whole year two shebang. A gentle, appropriate for the point in the year. Going back to intervention, pick up and go intervention. So children who need an additional session or children who might be receiving whole class input, but they might be working at a lower level for their independent practice and application. If, for example, you've just been teaching A, the bulk of the class would be working on pupil practice booklet seven. Here is the A content lesson for them. And you'd have to make a decision about whether the children that you're thinking of in particular that are working at a lower level, could they access that level with a bit more time, a bit more support, broken into different sessions with maybe an intervention session? Would that be right for them? And if not, earlier pupil practice booklets contain an abundance of A content that that might be the access, but it's still the A lesson. So they can still absolutely sit in that A content and it's appropriate for them, but when they practice it, it's at a slightly lower level for them. So that's the concept with that. And I think, oh, last little bit then, um, just a reminder of what sort of training and ongoing support is there. We have loads of different ways that people can be supported now. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered through the trials and working with partner schools is that some schools are kind of fine just from having some videos or having me come along and chat. And other schools might have other difficulties and challenges going on. And it might be more important to them that they have a bit more training or you know identify the needs and we need for you guys to speak up and shout if that's you so um i know i have one school that i need to reply to who's recently reached out to me and i'm going to email you back it's on top of my top of my mind after this session uh, that need a bit more support and so you can reach out and ask us that but we do do all sorts of training, bespoke training. Of course, you've got your online videos and I'll be imminently making some for year two. Social media, there's loads of Facebook groups now. There's the Rocket Phonics, uh, Reading Planet, Rocket Phonics teacher group. Kate's put a link for you um, in the chat there. The YouTube channel is always a good source of support and your local Rising Stars sort of sales rep, they're a really good source of support as well. So please don't hold back. Please do reach out if you need more training than we are sort of providing. Oh, that was my input. Right, go for questions. Oh, thank you, Louise. I'm sort of, I'm here with like bated breath and like, obviously I know it works. I know it's great, but it's like, actually, I, I, other people have to see, it's a conceptual thing, isn't it? For some people, I think people who, you guys have been working with Rocket Phonics already, so you'll get the concepts, but I'm, I'm nervous that teachers out in the market will have to get their head around the concept of how it all works. I'm hoping it's coming across clearly enough.
Yeah, that's true. There's been some amazing support actually, hasn't there, from schools on the Facebook group. And any of you that go on there, please do join in. It's really helpful. Abby, can I just mention as well, just to reiterate to people that, that the um, materials that you've got so far and some of those that Abby was showing there, they're at different stages in their development. So some are proofs, some are second proofs, some are close to publication. So, you know, if you're looking at something and you're thinking, oh, well, that doesn't look very exciting because the visuals aren't in there or they're not in full colour or there's a mistake there or, or whatever. Um, it's because they're going through that process at the moment. And as soon as we can get you more refined materials, we will do. Yeah, any more questions, guys, or any concerns? Or about any of the programme, not just year two, I guess. Indeed. So we've got a few minutes. I've got a question, but I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. Um, we we absolutely love Rocket Phonics, so thank you so much. We are really enjoying it in reception, year one. I'm very excited about year two. I teach a mixed year class, so it's going to be really helpful to us. And we think about restructuring how we do it. But obviously, we're coming up to phonics screening. Um, we're thinking about phonics screening. We're doing lots of tests. And because we follow the Rocket Phonics, we're finding that our children, when they come to read, even some of the basic words like DAC, for example, are sometimes saying dake and they're using the alternatives that they perhaps previously wouldn't have been introduced to at this point. So it doesn't say anywhere in the guidance what is acceptable and what is not when it's one of these nonsense words. So we don't quite know what to say. It should. It should say in the guidance. Um, I'll check as well, but it, from my understanding, it says in the guidance that alternative pronunciations are acceptable. They are acceptable, right? Because yes, we were thinking absolutely. because it's one of this one so the cat that's great if that's what it is we yeah and it and do you know what it might be that it says it in relation to real work it definitely says something definitely right. says something but that's a really good point i'm going to write that down because if you're thinking that other people will be thinking that so that's something that i'd like to kind of get out there it's not something we've come across until we started rocket phonics previously they've always just done those first initial sounds but now because they've got so much more um, in their arsenal, if you like, they're, they're, they're experimenting. <laughs> Love them. I take that as a good sign. How have you, how have you found it with the fact that, that we don't provide in Rocket Phonics teaching content on pseudo words? Have you had to build lots in or have you done less than you might normally do? I think we have done less and what we've done is um, alongside it we use uh, phonics tracker um, have you seen phonics tracker so yeah. we use that and then just intermittently we'll just keep assessing them and they're just very familiar with if they, they see the alien it's a nonsense word and but it's not really I don't think it's affected us not negatively at all because I think there was a concern at the beginning of the year that they wouldn't get as much experience but I, I don't think it's a problem for us lovely thank you for feeding that back because that's one of the things of like I know that and I'm confident about that, but it's a big leap of faith to ask people to come on when we've spent years doing loads of that kind of teaching. Yeah. Um, lovely. Oh, thanks, Carrie. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. I'd like to say it's stayed up from Scotland. We've got a multi-composite primary one to four class, which is the equivalent of reception to year three. So coordinating is quite a challenge. We've got some recovery staffing this year, so we do split them all up. But what we're finding now is our reception, so our P1s and P2s who have been really just rocket are now overtaking our threes and fours because that's yeah, so we've, um, the RP4s are working on the year one content, which and we're just kind of looking at the data because we've just done the next round of assessment and they're just so much more secure. And I think it's just having that systematic from the beginning. They've not got the mismatch of phonics resources that we had. And also they haven't had the, the lockdown experience to the same extent, but yeah, what a difference. So yeah, we're just, we're loving it, but we just need to get, we don't have the additionality in our staffing, how we're actually going to 
juggle the four classes in the one classroom with one teacher over the week to get everything in yes that's that's the trick does it does it give you encouragement seeing that the year two goes back through the code so you can be having multiple well, levels we were having this discussion because the what we're finding is that they're not really retaining you know, some of the trickier ones they're really not retaining it so i was saying to the staff well, i'm hoping when the next one comes out that there is a revisit just to show them so that would be good and i suppose there's going to be times where we can overlap it but we really want to stick to it as is because otherwise it'd be tricky to manage but yeah i'm just thinking maybe i'll move my p4s into a five six seven next year just to reduce it because I, I i just don't think i'm gonna have the staffing but it's um yeah we're definitely seeing the impact so i love it oh thank you sarah brilliant um just to flag to you all there's a note from alex in the chat there from the marketing team if anyone's interested in being part of a meet your local rocket phonics school webinar like sarah's about to aren't you sarah that's you is it tomorrow yours yeah tomorrow after school yes brilliant then let kate know um oh and kate you've been on it so quickly there's that quote alternative pronunciations or graphemes will be allowed in pseudo words uh, the scoring guidance gives some alternative pronunciations, but the list of acceptable pronunciations is not exhaustive. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Katie. Brilliant. Oh, guys, you've made me feel a lot better. I've just, it's just, it's nerve wracking, isn't it? Like, I'm excited to put it out there to you all, but it's also nerve wracking. Um, especially year two teachers can be a tough crowd. So if we can get our year two teachers excited about sort of carrying on this phonics, and I think it's going to serve our children so well for moving them up to key stage two. So great stuff. Brilliant. Right, okay. Then. Unless anybody's got any further questions, Fabi, I think probably we're, we're a little bit over time now, so we'll, we'll need to wrap up. But thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, I'll stop the recording now and I'll send it all out to you as soon as it's available and to those people that weren't able to attend. Thank you so much, Abby. Lovely. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.